Guess what, another Wi-Fi 7 presentation. Um, I believe Wes was on stage and he said Wi-Fi 7 is not a thing yet. And it actually is a thing, sort of. Um, but, um, so I, that's what I'm gonna talk about and I'm gonna expand a lot on what Jim said as well, uh, which um, pretty much agree with 95.2% uh, uh, of your observations, my friend. Um, but um, well, I'm just gonna give it from my perspective and then throw in a, f a few other little things. <clears throat> Pardon me. So um, if you don't know me, I'm Dave Coleman. I'm with Extreme Networks with the Office of the CTO. Uh, if you're not linked up to it with me on LinkedIn, please do so. So one of the things I like to talk about a lot is um, our industry and Wi-Fi in general. And I like to talk to people when I'm evangelizing that Wi-Fi is a way of life. We use it at work. We use it at play. Um, we use it when we travel. Um, you use it all the time. And it has become the premier access technology of uh, several generations now. Um, and uh, we're very lucky to be in this industry because we work with some really cool technology. Would you rather be doing uh, firewall ACLs and IP subnetting all the time? Uh, I mean, instead we're working with cool technology. So um, I'm very grateful for that. We sh should all be. It, Wi-Fi is a way of life. And it, it, we celebrated a really cool anniversary last night of 10 years of WLPC and Keith, but what you might not know is it was recently announced that it's, we're now celebrating 25 years of Wi-Fi with the Wi-Fi Alliance and Wi-Fi in general. And every four or five years, there's a new generation of Wi-Fi. We know that. But in the last couple of years, it seems like there's been three or four scrunched together. And as you can see in this diagram, but a lot of it, especially the last two, is what we're going to focus on and have been focusing on the last couple conventions. And it's what I'm calling the error of 6 gigahertz Wi-Fi connectivity. It started with Wi-Fi 6E, and will Wi-Fi 7 will be a driver of continuing the error of 6 gigahertz connectivity. And one of the things that I think Wi-Fi is really going to drive a lot, a Wi-Fi 7, I should say, is standard power. Okay, so um, you're going to see some repetitive slides here, so I'll try to go quickly through some of the repetition that you've seen with other vendors' presentations, but standard power is coming to the United States, and it's fairly imminent. Um, we've been talking about it for a couple of years, but uh, bottom line, it gives us greater power. We can stout um, than LPI. We can use it outdoors. We can use it with external antenna connectors and also weatherized devices. It's not as much as the frequency space, only Uni 5 and Uni 7, um, and it's coming soon to the United States. It also will follow in Canada. In Canada, they also get a little bit of extra frequency space for standard power um, because they also get Uni 6. And once again, there's a whole um, ecosystem for this, and you, you've seen similar diagrams where APs basically are reporting their geo coordinates to an AFC provider using an API call and get permission to use a channel at a certain power level so they don't interfere with incumbents. Um, one thing I do want to point out that I don't think has been um, really said yet is, is it the AP talking to the AFC provider? And um, whether it's Wi-Fi 6 EAP or Wi-Fi 7, um, uh, could be, but I think in most cases it'll be a proxy. So if it's a controller architecture, it'll be the controller proxying, proxying the geolocation to the um, AFC provider. And if it's a cloud-based service, it'll be basically a cloud-to-cloud -cloud communication. Um, this is, as I said, imminent. Um, as a matter of fact, the seven AFC providers that have been approved for the United States, I think they have permission to go live like this week. Um, additionally, though, the vendors still have to wait for what's called persistent approval and query, PIA. What that basically means is we have to prove our method of being able to get uh, report the geolocation coordinates is accurate and correct within 95% level of accuracy. And, uh, you know, outdoors, that's pretty easy. You're using GPS. Uh, once vendors get the PIA approval, then they can get certified, and then we'll start lighting up uh, six gigahertz uh, with standard power. Um, now, 
Um, you've seen some of these other slides, very similar slides. Uh, how do you know if it's, uh, whether it's Wi-Fi 7 or Wi-Fi 6E, how do you know if it's LPI or if it's uh, standard power? Well, it's a regulatory bit, so there's a regulatory bit for an LPI AP. There's one for the standard power AP. It's right there. Um, you can find it in beacon frames. Uh, as you've also been pointed out in several other presentations, there's the transmit power envelope, which indicates the power levels that have been granted to the AP for various channel sizes, as well as what the cli client power can be used. And I have two examples here. So here's one uh, of my outdoor APs um, that was granted on a certain channel, those power levels. But you can see right here on the different channel sizes, it's different power levels, EIRP, that it can use so that it doesn't interfere with the incumbent. So it's gonna be a little bit different depending on basically where your geolocation is. Now, the one thing I really wanna talk about is well, what clients are gonna to connect to this. And it's been, a couple other people have talked about there is a classification from the FCC called dual client. And all that means is a dual client with a six gigahertz radio, Wi-Fi 6E and Wi-Fi 7 can either be LPI power or it can be standard power. Now, I, it's my contention that Wi-Fi 7 absolutely will drive more certification of dual clients' capabilities. As a matter of fact, right there, you can see my Android uh, Pixel 8, which is a Wi-Fi 7 um, uh, smartphone. Uh, it is a dual client, and I've been able to connect it with standard power. My Mac Mini 2023 is also a Wi-Fi, it's a Wi-Fi 6E, but it is a dual client, and I've been able to connect it with standard power. Um, I, I checked last night on the FCC database, and currently there's 1,076 de client devices already approved for dual client capability. However, what about all the older devices that are still LPI? There is no guarantee that some of these first generation devices will be recertified as dual client. But can they be? And the answer is yes, they can. So you, they can get what's called a class two permissive change. And if they get that, then they can um, get uh, upload and get new firmware once they get this recertification and they, they can also use standard power. So I have good news and bad news. The good news, if you go on the FCC database, is a very big chipset vendor that finds their ways into laptops they've already gotten class two permissive change, okay? That does mean though, that doesn't mean though they'll work right now because you're gonna have to wait for the new firmware upgrades. The bad news is, will we see all older smartphones get recertified? Eh, I wouldn't count on it. So just be aware of that. There might be some older 6E phones that will never use standard power. Um, that being said, Wi-Fi 7 any Wi-Fi 7 and really any device moving forward, I'd be very surprised if it's not certified as dual client moving forward. Um, I, the next question I get asked all the time is, well, how do I know if it's dual client? So I made this slide for everybody. You can go to the FCC website and you can type in that information right there and you can download an Excel file. Everybody's taking pictures, I see. Um, and uh, they update this daily. So you can verify the dual client capability. So this is very, very helpful because you're gonna run into situations where you're gonna have a client that doesn't connect. Um, now, that being said, you might know that Extreme Networks does a lot of sports arenas and stadiums. And we already have uh, APs with six gigahertz radios for outdoor stadiums ready to go and ready to light, light up. So as soon as we get our PIA and certification, we're gonna light them up. And we believe that we will be using standard power and we'll be using probably a 40, channel, uh, 40 megahertz channel design because you can have as many as tw uh, 20, 40 megahertz channels using standard power. Now it doesn't mean they'll all be available because once again, if there's an incumbent in place, you may not be able to get that channel. Um, and I wanna verify what um, I believe Wes said too, um, that, uh, non-PSC um, channels, 
it still works. Clients will still connect just fine. Um, and that's what this diagram is showing right here, one with a PSC channel, 140 megahertz that doesn't have a PSC channel. As long as you have the out-of-band discovery, you'll be able to connect just fine. So that, that is good news for everybody. Now, I'm gonna do a, a quick little demo here. So, and show you uh, a little of what we've built. So I was very excited about the Homina tool and their partnership with uh, Wi-Fi um, Alliance Services. That is our AFC provider as well. And I love the fact that uh, what they've built. We've built something a little bit different where this is Oracle Park in San Francisco, which is a customer of ours. Um, I'm drawing a polygon around that park and we'll let the video go real quick, but basically a little bit different from what you saw from UC where it's one AP at a time for a, for a model. We, choose an area, and within that area, we can have multiple reference points and then show you all the available channels that are available and a particular power level. So you can see right here, we're good to go in that stadium. Um, now, once again, this is kind of just a, a visibility and an educational tool in my mind, but I, I want to show you this as well. Well, I'm going to draw a polygon around those piers and I'll draw it around the piers that are right adjacent to the stadium. And let's see what we see. Come on, video. And here we go. And now you'll see something very different. Look at the channels, and now look at the power levels. A lot of the power levels are a lot lower because there's some incumbents that are shooting across that bay. So, um, so really, that's why the geolocation information is, is very, very important. Another thing I want to show you too, this is our controller, and I'm just going to go right here and show you, here's an AP, under seat AP, there's its coordinates that it's gotten from its AFC provider, and once it gets the coordinates, then you can choose from the channel, from the available channels, and the power settings that are allowed. Another thing that is really cool that you should do is maybe even designate a backup channel for AFC, because what if a new incumbent goes along, because with AFC you have to check in every day, and what if a new incumbent comes along, and you're probably using static channels here, and if you're using static channels, um, you might wanna have a, a good backup plan. Now that doesn't mean that you can't use AFC with RRM, but I can tell you in Stadiums, we don't use RRM, we use static channels. So having a backup is probably a pretty good idea. Now, um, so quickly, uh, a few more things, and I'll dig deeper into Wi-Fi 7. Um, what about indoors and standard power? I've heard some people say that they don't think it's gonna be a play, and that's what I kinda used to think, but I'm thinking differently now. Now, there, first of all, there's going to be challenges. How do you get the geolocation um, capabilities indoors? And some vendors have been showing like a combination of GPS anchors and 802.11mc, uh, others barometers. Um, you know, at the end of the day, there's no perfect solution because there's going to be scenarios indoors where GPS just doesn't work. And then you have to get that PIA approval that it'll work indoors from the FCC. Um, there could be ways to do this, believe it or not, without GPS. So stay tuned. I think you'll see vendors do a, a variety of things and methods. But once those challenges are met over the coming year, Wi-Fi 7 will drive wider adoption of dual client capabilities, meaning standard power, and you can use them indoors. Additionally, consumer grade vendors are, 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 are supporting standard power. And you know why they want it? They want it for range at home. So you're gonna see consumer grade vendors use standard power. Um, and there will be situations, as was pointed out earlier, that LPI six gigahertz client power may be insufficient in some use cases, and you might need that higher power indoors. So I'm thinking in a lot of enterprise verticals, standard power might make more sense. And, uh, and then in some enterprise verticals, you may need weatherized APs and detachable antennas or both indoors, and you can't do that with LPI. So there's, I think there will be a play for standard power indoors. And, I, and the next thing I get asked is, is there such a thing as like a dual client AP? Well, there is not a classification for that. 
Okay, the FCC doesn't. However, the AFC providers, what they're doing is they're applying for waivers. So we could potentially build something called a composite AP that could use either standard power or LPI power indoors only. Okay, so you may see animals like that and Wi-Fi 7 will probably uh, drive something, but that, uh, that is more, that's a negotiation between the AFC providers and uh, the FCC. Now, and then the last note on this that I wanna uh, talk about before I move into some of the Wi-Fi 7 features that Jim has already talked about is, once again, I contend that Wi-Fi 7 will drive along with Wi-Fi 6E, more adoption of standard power and not just outdoors. And think about this, if you wanted to use standard power indoors, if we, when we get to that point, is if you're using LPI, you can use a channel reuse pattern of you know, 1480 megahertz channels, but at its lower client power, and we know that might cause problems, but if you use standard power, you could use a 40 megahertz channel plan the trade-off is you don't have as much bandwidth, but you do get 20 channels, potentially, for a channel reuse pattern, and you also then get the higher client power. So, food for thought, my guess is next year, or maybe two years, we're all gonna be talking about indoors and standard power a lot, and we'll have, we'll have data, which we don't have yet, okay? Now, let's talk about the Wi-Fi 7 bells and whistles. Because once again, that's kind of what it is. It's bells and whistles. So Jim's already talked about there's 320 megahertz channels. We, not, we know they're not going to scale in the enterprise. Okay, that's a consumer grade feature. Um, what you will see some of these consu consumer grade vendors, some will use a default setting of 160 megahertz channels. Some will do this. They'll use a default setting of 320 megahertz channels. The, the fear is that I've mentioned in previous sessions is that this will cause OB, guaranteed to cause OBSS interference if any of these consumer grade devices are using these bigger channels um, where primary and secondary channels are stepping on each other and your throughput goes down. I'm not gonna revisit that. Go watch one of the older videos from, from I think a year or two years ago and you can also uh, read blogs on that particular topic. But um, those big channels, it, could potentially cause problems. 4K QAM, 20% increase in performance. Okay, 20% increase in performance. Will it work? Yep, it works. Um, you know, I did some testing, and I, and I believe Francois is going to be talking about in his next presentation about MSC uh, uh, rates and Wi-Fi 7. But um, I used this. Um, OnePlus uh, 11 phone, it's a Chinese company, Android, and I did some testing and that was the data rate it was using, not throughput, that's a data rate, okay, and um, using MCS 13 and it was using 4K QAM. Okay, so it works, but you have to, ha look, look at the signal strength, the signal strength that I had to connect to that thing was like negative 40, yeah, <laughs> negative 40. So you're gonna need um, an SNR of about 41, 42 dB for it to kick in. So you're gonna, it's pristine RF environment. So once again, consumer grade feature. Um, Multi-link operation. Okay, so this is the one, once again, that all of us geeks kind of have high hope for, maybe, um, in the enterprise. And once again, MLO is think multiple bands and multiple channels. And as Jim pointed out, there's three kinds I'm just gonna concentrate on two of them, okay? So, there's the data aggregation. And once again, the thinking is, what if I could aggregate a, uh, maybe a, a big giant six gigahertz channel along with an extra set of data on the five gigahertz channel, transmit them at the same time, and presto, I have this great amazing throughput in 46 gigabits per second. Sounds wonderful, right? Um, that's the technical term for the technology. The, um, the problem is it's not gonna work. It's not gonna work with clients and none of the client vendors, at least in first generations, are gonna support it. And it uh, has, been, has been pointed out many times before, it has to do with medium contention. Being able to synchronize two channels and two bands at the same time um, to achieve this between a client and the AP, you know, if, you know in a Faraday cage. 
uh, uh, the, the client vendors aren't going to be supporting this in early days, okay? But it will work for this. It will work for Mesh, okay? And I have high hopes for this in the enterprise, and I have some data from, for you from our, our friends at Linksys who shared this with me. Um, and uh, they are actually um, have done some testing because they want to use MLO Mesh for backhaul and home networks. And as you can see, um, they're getting aggregate data by feeding both five and six gigahertz channels, very wide ones granted, of over five gigs. And then when they run it across a backlink, they're getting uh, four gigs, uh, um, almost five gigs, up to about 80, 70, up to about 77 or 80 percent efficiency um, on what's called an MLO backhaul link. Um, and that's throughput, okay, not data rates. So you know where I'm going with you, don't you? Okay, and most of you are going to start booing when I say this. We finally need multi gig. <laughs> <laughs> I just did. <laughs> um, look, it, it's, look, we've been hearing this for 10 years, and it's been mostly corner cases, but I can tell you right now, if, you, if you're going to be using uh, MLO in the enterprise or at home, if you're going to be using MLO backhauls, um, a one gig uplink will be a bottleneck. So, I mean, it's kind of a, I can't believe we've been talking about it for 10 years, but I'm, I stand by this statement now. Now, that being said, uh, the one that will work between APs and clients is this one right here. And that is the steering capability, where you're steering back and forth, transmitting back and forth between five and six. The whole point of this, once again, is to enhance latency um, and, and better latency. There is a name for it. It's called EMLSR channel access. Think of, a, once again, a two by two uh, listening with one, one by one radio chain on five and one on six, whichever channel becomes available, it then transmits on that channel with both radio chains. And that could be on a per packet basis. And this is supported, and, um, uh, but there's not a lot of data on what kind of performance enhancements or latency enhancements we're gonna get other than in laboratories so, so far. So I never believe anything until it's field tested, but the clients will support this. Um, there is two MAC layers for this. Um, there's an upper MAC and a lower MAC. The lower MAC is where all the security and all your frame exchanges still occur and where your radio MAC addresses are. All the upper MAC is for is to communicate to the higher layers. Um, and uh, that upper MAC will use what is called a multi-link device MAC address to represent the MLO uh, association. And there'll be one for, for both sides of the link, for the client and the AP. And there's a new ML uh, multi-link element, information element, that's used to communicate that information and ca MLO capabilities between an, a, an AP and a client. And there's a full discovery and setup where they share that ML, that upper layer MAC address with each other uh, during the association. And why I think this is kind of cool is that uh, MLD MAC address instead of the radio's MAC address is what feeds the four-way handshake which, as you know, is then used to create your dynamic encryption key. So what's cool about that is, if, especially if you're doing the link steering, is you're using the same uh, pairwise transit key on both bands and both channels. Uh, as opposed to, you know, if you use band steering, if you move between five and six, you have to do a whole new four-way handshake. Well, in this case, you only do one four-way handshake, and you're using the same pairwise transit key. Uh, cool for us Wi-Fi geeks that have been talking about the four-way handshake for 20 years. Um, there, there's packet captures to show you that this does indeed work. Um, and you can actually see it right here in, uh, in a frame. You can see that's the client MLD address, and that is the uh, AP MLD address. Uh, there's also, there's, and there's that whole field with other capabilities indicating that it supports uh, the link steering capabilities. So I do want to, I have like four or five minutes left, and I want to give you a few final thoughts about um, Wi-Fi 7 and just six gigahertz in general. Um, once again, Wi-Fi 7, the, probably the bigger discussion once again is PoE. I've mentioned this many times. Um, uh, 15 watts is not going to be enough anymore. Two by two by two, you're going to need AT power. Um, uh, with four by four by fours for full functionality, 
unless you have some sort of downgrade capability, you're going to need BT power. It's just a fact of life. Um, um, why I'm worried about this is those turning APs represent APs rebooting randomly. If they're not properly powered, they randomly reboot. That's the number one support call most enterprise vendors get. Okay, <clears throat> So watch your power budgets carefully. Very, very important. Um, and you know, the other thing I want to talk about is security. And so our guidance has changed um, multiple times since um, the last couple of years of six gigahertz. Uh, initially, we talked about different la uh, layers of security and different bands and segmenting by bands. And there's nothing wrong by that. I'm, uh, I'm nothing wrong with segmenting both security as well as um, or more, more SSIDs by frequency space. <clears throat> Pardon me, that's a common practice. Um, uh, the guidance now, though, is that WPA3 transition modes for the enterprise, go ahead and use it. Um, it's been proven pretty much that uh, everybody, it works pretty well with like well over 95% of the clients. So you can use uh, a, a same SSID on five and six with WPA enterprise, um, like Edge Realm, for example. So um, no problem with that. Um, I disagree with some people about using the transition modes for WPA3 personal. Um, despite numbers to the contrary from other people, we still see a lot of devices, um, older legacy devices, that when you turn on the transition mode do not connect. So just that's up to you. Okay, um, and um, I'm not a big fan of OWE, and I'm not a big fan of guest networks on six gigahertz either. But look. One size doesn't fit all. The whole point is everybody has different strategy. But I will say this, MLO, that could be for three bands, more than likely it's just two bands. That's gonna be a different SSID. My, do you think MLO is gonna be on by default on the enterprise APs? I don't think so. Um, and if you turned it on, what do you think about the backward compatibility? We don't have data yet and they're talking about MLO transition modes. Okay, so my, if, uh, my recommendation, if you decide to turn on MLO, at least in the short term, just use it with Wi-Fi 7 clients, okay? Um, in the short term, and as we learn more, we'll, we'll go from there. And then, I, once again, you know, use six gigahertz as an opportunity to think creatively. So the, my good buddy Carl Benedict came up with this, and we've been using it very successfully. We're pushing mission critical apps to six gigahertz, and maybe you have a, you're using a WPA3 enterprise application, um, excuse me, a WPA3 enterprise security, either with or without transition modes, and you basically are trying to keep that mission critical app on six gigahertz, but it, you've, if you're using LPI power, maybe there's a little area where you don't have six gigahertz connectivity, you have the availability to, to do the inner band roaming, and, uh, but for the most part, you're trying to keep that mission critical app on six gigahertz. So five gigahertz for roaming, six gigahertz for capacity, um, in case you have to fall back to five gigahertz. So I, I'm, I think you're going to see all kinds of interesting strategies where people move things, uh, d different applications um, to six gigahertz. And then um, we all know that you can use in North America 1480 megahertz channels for LPI. But let me give you another food for thought. Um, 802.11mc is starting to grow in power, um, popularity. Uh, so that's supported on all devices, but it's supported on Android devices. And also think about... Um, uh, it, but the bigger the channel, the more accurate um, 802.11mc is. So think about this. What if you had an overlay? What if you use 6 gigahertz simply for like in a warehouse with like a Zebra device on 6 gigahertz and you used 160 megahertz channels in a, ch a, a cha uh, <coughs> channel reuse pattern of these seven channels? And you're going to get, you know, very, very, very accurate sub one meter accuracy with 802.11mc. So, and it's, you know, and forthcoming 802.11az that's coming very soon as well. So, just an out of the box way to think, okay? But this is, you know, kind of strategies and things that this group should be thinking about as well. Um, 
The dummies booklet is still available. I keep getting asked, is there going to be a Wi-Fi for seven dummies? I can say, yes, I've been mandated to write one, so later this year. <laughs> so stay tuned for that. And, um, and just to, the last, to sum it all up, you know, I've been saying this for a couple of years, the paradigm shift is six gigahertz. You know, Wi-Fi 7, few new bells and whistles. You know, we've had 10 years now of WLPC. So in, in the next 10 years, what version of Wi-Fi do you think we're gonna be at 10 years from now? 14? All right, anybody else wanna make a bet? Let's do a pull, let's, remember 10 years ago, we said, you, Fernay said 14. Okay, Wi-Fi 14 in 10 years, we'll see. So with that, I just wanna say Wi-Fi is a way of life and six gigahertz is the future. Thank you very much.